Three well-organized and democratic elections have shown that the legal framework is properly working. However, new problems and challenges that the 1996 reform could not contemplate have come up a new, and a new integrated electoral reform is needed. In my opinion, such a reform has to focus on political parties, on how to reduce their public funding and campaign expenses, how to limit their access to media, and in the end, how to make them really accountable. We are um, very fortunate today to have with us three excellent scholars uh, from Mexico who will uh, each speak for approximately 20 minutes um, on these questions uh, and then give us some time for your questions. Uh, to make things less bureaucratic and faster, I will introduce all of them now uh, and then each of them will take a, a turn uh, making their remarks. Our first presenter uh, will be Jacqueline Pechard, professor at the National University in Mexico and former member of the Federal Electoral Institute. She will be followed by Lorenzo Mayer, who is a professor at the Colegio de Mexico. And after Lorenzo Mayer, the last of the presentations will be made by Jorge Chabat, who is also a professor, in this case, at the CIDE, Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económica. Good morning, I'm glad to be here with you. I'd like to thank the University of Chicago for the opportunity of being with you this morning. Uh, I have prepared a paper uh, that is titled Living Without Electoral Reforms. During the last quarter of the 20th century, transition to democracy in Mexico was made possible through a series of electoral reforms in the context of a hegemonic party rule the passing of electoral laws capable of organizing free, trustworthy, and competitive elections was the first necessary link of a democratic institutional scaffolding. The 1996 electoral reform set the main pillars of the democratic electoral system, putting an end to the long term of disputes regarding electoral rules. Such a reform made the electoral institute fully autonomous, created a jurisdictional specialized body to solve electoral controversies in a definitive and irrefutable way, and established equitable rules of public funding and access to media for political parties. Additionally, the electoral code reinforced control over the origin and destination of party resources. Such a regulation fulfilled the necessary conditions of a technically effective norm with a widely legitimate support. The 1997 election proved that such a code was useful enough to organize free and competitive contests as losers themselves complied with the outcome and accepted the legal procedures to appeal any of the steps of the electoral process. The traditional gap between electoral institutions and the adoption of the rules was finally closed. Democratization through electoral reforms had important political consequences as it paved the way legally, politically, and symbolically for plurality to be set on a firm basis. Electoral competition brought forth a multi-party system with three well-rooted parties. Congress gained political relevance to such a point that the political gravity center shifted from the executive to the legislative and the local dimension of politics became nationally important. It is true that the Mexican transition to democracy did not mean the breakdown of the former regime, but it was not a mere gradual regime opening either, because political dynamics in Mexico experienced a dramatic change. Nevertheless, this change was not accompanied by institutional reforms capable of making this change with a new plurality politically effective. Um, that is, it was, um, that, that is making it an ingredient of democratic governance. Plurality demands agreement among the main political actors and there is no institutional, there are no institutional incentives to enhance them. After alternation in power in the 2000s, the search for political agreement to introduce the necessary institutional reforms was hindered mainly by three factors. 
First, the overrated expectations of change. Second, the dispersion of power. And third, disputes inside political parties. The enormous expectation of a quick and overall change that the PRI electoral defeat would bring would bring about were confirmed by what the Fox government promised to carry out upon arrival in power. Such promises and expectations did not match with the nature of the new government, whose most salient characteristic was being a divided one, with 41% of the seats in the Chamber of Deputies, 36% in the, in the Senate, and additionally, the governing party only ruled over 25% of the federal states. After the 2003 midterm elections, the PAN only kept 30% of the seats in the lower house, and such a minority rule made it even harder to push forward the reforms that Fox had promised. The PRI defeat did not mean its nullification. On the contrary, at the moment, the PRI has a relative majority in Congress and controls 53% of the state government. Therefore, it is an obligatory negotiator for any party or political actor interested in building pluralistic agreement. Dispersion of power has reached the internal structure of the three most important parties, which have been traditionally centralized. The decision-making process was concentrated in the party national presidents, and the parliamentary leaders simply followed their directions. Nowadays, the legislative power has gained political weight, and there is a constant dispute between party and parliamentary leaders, and this is particularly evident in the PRI, where rivalry shows even inside the parliamentary fraction. A divided government and the lack of strong and fixed negotiators capable of adopting decisions and making their parties comply with them have worked against political agreement, and Congress has not been able to pass the structural and institutional reforms that are needed. Such obstacles have affected the country's political governance. In this paper, I will, deal, I will deal with what has happened in the electoral field after their nation in power. Three well-organized and democratic elections have shown that the legal framework is properly working. However, new problems and challenges that the 1996 reform could not contemplate have come up a new, and a new integrated electoral reform is needed. In my opinion, such a reform has to focus on political parties, on how to reduce their public funding and campaign expenses, how to limit their access to media, and in the end, how to make them really accountable. I will um, focus on three main topics and see what changes have been done through the regulating capacities of the electoral authorities as there haven't been any reforms after the 1996 electoral reform, then these institutions have been able to profit from their own regulating uh, capacities to make up for the, uh, for the lack of electoral reforms. And I will stop at uh, three different topics, the scope of electoral authorities' capacities, the encouragement of citizens' political rights, and accountability of political parties. The scope of electoral authorities' capacities. One of the most important innovations brought up by the 1996 reform was the creation of the electoral court, which allowed electoral conflicts, uh, both local and federal, to be resolved in the jurisdictional grounds and not in the political ones as it had been done in the previous years. During the first three years of the electoral court's life, its resolutions followed a formalistic interpretation of the law that is one that sticks literally to the norms. Such a behavior identified the tribunal as a discreet and certain authority, but it was criticized by opposition groups, which considered that such behavior meant supporting the incumbent legal order. After alternation in power, the electoral court moved, let's say, from a formalistic to a guarantistic position, which means going beyond the strict interpretation of the law to widen its protective role and to make electoral justice more effective, as Magistrate Jesus Orozco has put it. In some cases, resolutions based on an extended interpretation of the law filled legislation laps, but in some, uh, gaps, but in some others, they have introduced further legal uncertainty. The most audacious electoral court resolution was no doubt annulling the gubernatorial election in Tabasco in 2000, 
and it was based on an abstract annulment clause, that is, on one that was not directly included in the electoral code, but that could be derived from a generic consideration about constitutional definition of what a free or competitive election is. The tribunal established that due to the fact that the different parties had not received equitable access to electronic media during the campaign, the election had not been democratically oriented and should therefore be annulled. A few days after President Fox had taken over power, the electoral court's resolution was considered brave, daring, and politically correct by an important sector of the national public opinion. However, it was legally controversial as going beyond the annulment causes specifically stated in the Tabasco Electoral Code introduced a discretionary element. This resolution was a reference for the annulment of two federal deputies' elections in 2003 in the districts of Zamora and Torreón, where again the Electoral Court claimed the generic annulment cause that states that if there is an overall violation of the Electoral Code during election day, the election may be annulled. Uh, the second topic is the encouragement of citizens' political rights. The extension of electoral competition has had an enormous effect on parties' internal life, as it has deepened the dispute over the internal posts and candidacies and the party selection rules that were in force during the hegemonic period are no longer valid. The General Council of IFE is capable of investigating and penalizing political parties if they violate the electoral code or if they do not follow their own internal statutes. After the 2000 ele uh, presidential elections, the number of complaints of party members against their leaders increased significantly as compared with the complaints that IFE received and that are presented against party adversaries. Traditionally, the General Council carried out an investigation following a basic criterion to certify that the leaders had obeyed the internal party rules. If not, the party would be sanctioned. Gradually, the members' protest went further and claimed the replacement of the illegal, illegal procedures. The 1996 reform included a general electoral appeal law to regulate the different types of appeals that may be submitted to the tribunal against electoral authorities' decisions and actions. One of these appeals is a lawsuit for the protection of the political and electoral rights of citizens. By going beyond the law, the electoral court established that the lawsuit for protection of political and electoral rights, which is addressed against electoral authorities, could be invoked to protect the political rights of party members. If the appeal was solved positively, the tribunal would order the annulment of the Party Internal Decision Act. This sentence considered by the, was considered by the different political parties as a clear interference of the state's authority in party affairs. The most controversial case regarding this matter was that of a group of dissidents of the Green Party, the PVEM, who claimed that the party statutes were not democratic because their national president concentrated a series of veto capacities. The electoral court ordered IFE to force the party to democratize its statutes, and in due course, the party would have to select his, its leaders once again through the new procedures certified by IFE. The debate around electoral authorities' competence towards the internal life of parties is not, is not solved yet. However, the electoral court has specified which must be the contents of party statutes regarding their leaders and candidate selection. It is true that parties have historically had uh, very vertical structures, that parties have to take effective decisions and keep internal cohesion if they are to win elections. That is why parties should be allowed to fix their own rules independently without state interference. Besides, party members' rights cannot be assimilated to citizens' rights because being part of a party is a voluntary act that does not derive immediately, immediately from one's nationality as citizenship does. What the law must guarantee is that party statutes approved by the party directive organs respect some basic democratic principles. 
the electoral authority should act only as uh, if a member's claim came uh, to the authority, to IFE, and if party, if his party rights were violated and that the, the internal mechanisms to solve those problems did not work properly. The last topic is accountability of political parties. In, Mexico's, uh, politi in Mexico, political parties are constitutionally defined as public interest entities because of the relevant functions that they fulfill and the important amounts of money that they receive. IFE is entitled, therefore, to keep permanent control over party income and expenses. Parties must submit a fully documented annual and campaign financial report to IFE. The General Council at IFE issued a regulation with the details of the procedures that will guide the checking of those reports to determine whether political parties have administered the resources legally. In the 2000 presidential election, it came clear that there was a gap in the electoral code because the internal candidate selection process was not regulated and, it, uh, and that it allowed the parties to spend as much as they could or as they wanted to in their open internal contests without having to inform the electoral authority about those expenses. Profiting from its regular, regulatory capacity, IFE introduced reforms in its supervisory regulation to force parties to include in their uh, annual finance report the internal contest expenses going from the moment in which the call on candidates is launched to that in which the candidate is selected. However, this information cannot be considered part of the campaign expenses nor of their ceiling, of the campaign ceiling, because it is not contemplated by the electoral law. I will go now, finally, to um, relating what the electoral authorities have done regarding their own regulation um, capacities with two initiatives that are now being discussed in Congress that had to do with electoral reform, with this um, new generation electoral reform. The two most important electoral reform initiatives that are being discussed in Congress one was introduced by government and the other by a group of legislators, proposed a pre-campaign regulation that will fix its length and ceiling expenses. Although both initiatives agree that individuals should not promote their, uh, their future candidacies before those pre-campaign periods, and if they do, they will not be registered as candidates, the legislators' initiative prohibits individuals to contract spots in electronic media a year before the launching of the pre-campaign. I believe that this type of regulation affects the fundamental rights of citizens because they will be restrained from the right to express freely their own ideals and political objectives. If parties have to the exclusive right to nominate candidates, they should be responsible of informing how much was spent by their candidates on the road to the pre-campaign. The most important electoral court resolution regarding the topic of party accountability was issued in response to the appeal presented by the PRI against the popular case Amigos de Fox. The tribunal determined that IFE was a sort of treasury authority regarding the supervision of party finances. Such a definition allowed IFE to demand the National Bank Commission the bank account copies of the people and enterprises that had secretly contributed to Vicente Fox campaign and pre-campaign. This resolution enabled IFE to fulfill its investigation, identify the irregularities that had been committed, and impose a penalty on the two parties that had supported Vicente Fox. However, the tribunal sentence only referred to the specific case of Amigos de Fox Therefore, an electoral code reform is needed to give IFE the right to remove the bank and fiscal secrecies when it investigates party resources. Both electoral reform initiatives that are being discussed in Congress suggest that the supervisory faculties of IFE should be deepened and increased. That is, there is a sort of common extended opinion that it is necessary to reinforce IFE's capacity to help parties become fully accountable. During the first ordinary period of the present uh, 59th legislature, the government and its party were not able to convince the majoritarian party to support the fiscal reform initiative. 
the disputes inside the PRI between its parliamentary leader and its national president split the party vote in the Chamber of Deputies and the reform was not passed. However, two days before the first ordinary period ended, the majority of the parliamentary fractions agreed to pass a reform to block the possibility for new political organizations to become political parties. The reform doubled the number of affiliates needed to, to, uh, as a requirement to be a political party, and the entrance was restricted, restricted to only those who already have a legal status as national political associations. It is almost a commonplace to say that too many parties disperse political representation and do not enhance political agreements that, that is uh, essential to democratic governance. However, in the last three federal elections in Mexico, none of the newly registered parties have, that have participated on their own have reached the 2% that is needed to keep the legal registration. The problem was that of electoral coalitions that spared the new parties from, uh, from the obligation to conquer the 2% of the votes that is needed to maintain their party uh, category. Constraining coalition forming would have been enough to produce what was wanted. And the reform that was passed in last December established that newly registered parties cannot coalesce for the first time. What the parties which uh, pushed forward the initiative did not confess was that they wanted to avoid any external incentives for party splitting now that tensions inside them have started to become everyday events. Aware of the many coincidences that both electoral reform initiatives have, the government has insisted on this reform to show that political parties in Congress can come to terms and improve government's image image as an efficient political operator. Nevertheless, as this ordinary period comes to an end, it seems that in spite of the original coincidences between the two initiatives, after all, the PRI will not support any of the two, at least during this ordinary period. I believe that uh, there are two complicated topics in the two uh, electoral reform initiatives. However, I will not deal with the one um, uh, regarding the vote of Mexicans abroad. I will only, uh, because I mean, Secretary Creel and Professor Waldemar spoke about them. So I'm only going to speak about one that I think that is uh, really a complicated one, but I think that it is one of the topics that is more important in electoral reform, and that has to do with access of political parties to, to media. It has been proved that the majority of party resources are dedicated to media spots. During the last three federal elections, 55% of the total campaign expenses have been destined to buying media promotionals during political campaigns. Besides, the biggest illegal resources incidents in the past have dealt with hidden campaign media expenses. The two initiatives deal with this topic but very insufficiently, because none of them establish a limit to media purchases for political parties. The government, initiatives state, the government initiatives states that IFE is entitled to demand media owners to give in all the information regarding party spots purchases. On the other hand, the legislator's initiative proposes to eliminate parties' direct purchase from media and make IFE buy all the campaign spots itself. This concentrated purchase will allow all the parties to get the same price independently of the number of spots each one can afford. That is, it will introduce an equilibrium factor. Parties have concentrated their campaign strategies on media exposition of candidates. However, the excess of spots that have been transmitted during the last campaigns and the recent corruption scandals, as well as the one in the 2000 presidential election, have had a negative impact on citizens' perception towards political campaigns. I am convinced that the best reform should limit campaign spots exclusively to the ones received through the so-called state time. This would reduce the expenses significantly and control over party financing would be much easier. At the beginning of the legislature, second ordinary period of this uh, 
the 59th legislature. Everybody thought that the electoral reform would pass because representatives of the main political parties supported one or the other initiative and they had lots of coincidences. As this second ordinary period comes to an end on, the, on April the 30th, it seems that the electoral reform would be postponed for the next period. The divided government in Mexico seems to be pushing the party system towards a polarized one as the governing party finds it harder and harder to build agreements with one of the two other principal forces, while the latter, the two opposition forces, have only established agreement to block Congress initiatives, not to foster them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter will be Dr. Lorenzo Mayer from El Colegio de Mexico. Thank you very much. Uh, I cannot say that be back in Chicago is for me uh, really a pleasure. Uh, it's a tough university, but uh, it's an interesting, uh, always interesting situation. And I thank you uh, for this invitation. I will be talking, uh, I will be using my 20 minutes on the problems of uh, democracy, the non-consolidated Mexican democracy. So I will be a little bit uh, underlying the problems, the negative side, because if the political discourse of Mexico's president uh, or the Minister of the Interior reflects reality, then Mexico is today a vibrant new democracy, well on its way to consolidation. The political horizon is clear, the sun is shining, and the wind is calm. However, you saw uh, uh, this morning that that was a possibility. That is a possibility. However, outside the presidential house of Los Pinos, the political weather forecast is different, very different. And in Mexico, I think consolidation is not secure, and deconsolidation is a possibility, just a possibility. But we have to think about it. Larry Diamond, uh, an American political scientist, argues that consolidation of democracy is a process through which a broad and deep legitimization for democracy reaches a point where in the minds of the masses, the masses, or in the action of the elites, there is no alternative to such a political regime. If we accept this definition, then the situation in Mexico is ambiguous at best. Let us focus on the situation from the perspective of the masses. Five days ago, the United Nations Development Program, uh, somebody uh, talked about this uh, in the morning, presented in Lima its report on the status of democratic development in Latin America. This UNDP uh, investigation found, among other things, that 54.7% of Latin Americans could be more than willing to accept a non-democratic government, an authoritarian government to be precise, if, this is the if, if such political system could solve the economic problems of the region. I think, unfortunately, I think that Mexico uh, is, uh, is not deviating from this uh, view from this uh, Latin American norm. The last public opinion survey conducted by the Ministry of the Interior, by uh, Krill, or his people, about political attitudes in Mexico in the year 2003 shows that only 45% of the sample consider that Mexico is a democracy. And 29%, one third, almost one third, simply don't know what kind of political regime they are living. 
and probably they don't care about the, 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 the nature of the political regime. When questions questioned about the quality of Mexican democracy, only 23% find it satisfactory. In contrast, 60% are partially or completely dissatisfied uh, with Mexican democracy. What is even more disquieting is the fact that 60% of the respondents consider that a few strong leaders, that uh, links with the uh, United Nations report, 60% consider that a few strong leaders will be able to do more for the country than all the present legal frameworks, the democratic framework, and all the promises collected in the platforms of all political parties. So 60% are still considering that a strong leader will be the solution, a possible solution. They are not crying for a, a return of a, a caudillo, but they are still think that this is an interesting possibility. Well, this is from the point of the masses. They are not sure that democracy is uh, the best way, although they are acting in a, a more or less democratic way uh, right now. Now, let's look at the situation from the perspective of the elites. None of these institutional political actors that are active in, in Mexico, in Mexico's political arena right now, seems to be able, well, none of them are asking for a non-democratic uh, solution. That's for sure. That's the positive side, the brilliant side. But none of them seems to be able to charter and conduct the complex task of consolidating the new regime. Santiago Cris was telling us there is no way of uh, a working majority. Well, nobody knows exactly how to proceed uh, in Mexico to get that majority. What they are lacking, in my view, is a general or basic agreement among the elites about the means, but also, and this is the most important, about the ends of the political process. There is no agreement about what we really want to do with our democracy among the elites. Also, there is no consensus in the leadership about the nature of the best economic system for the 21st century. Mexico, as you know, is now an open market economy. But the role of the state intervention has not been clearly defined. Uh, and while some are asking for uh, further privatizations, privatizations of oil, of the oil industry, of the power industry, others are dead set against it. Uh, so the neoliberal uh, economic reforms uh, are not really uh, backed by, by the elite or by the public at large. While some powerful entrepreneurs are demanding public works and public financing to stimulate employment and a an stagnated economy, is, the Mexican economy has been stagnated since 1982. I will give you some figures. On average, per capita growth has been less than 1% since 1981 to the year uh, 2003. It, on average, to be precise, is 0.64% per year real growth. That is almost nothing. We have uh, really remained stagnated for 20 two years. And in the first three years of democracy, the real growth has been negative. So uh, there is democracy, but no economic growth. And while some are insisting, uh, as I said, that the state has to be more active, that the state has to be really, again, uh, to be in charge of promoting economic growth, others are insisting in a stringent fiscal policy uh, 
in order to keep inflation. Inflation is the big enemy. Inflation under control, and inflation is under control in Mexico, 4% per year, more or less. Uh, so we have this uh, division among the, the elite. It's not a, in regard to um, a political development. It's in regard to economic development. There is no agreement. That is why we don't have a blueprint for the future. Uh, we are uh, living day by day, administrating democracy, but not projecting democracy towards something really meaningful uh, for the, the majority of Mexicans, to create an idea of something that is bright and shining over there, almost uh, around the corner. Everybody agrees that it's urgent to do something about social structure. Uh, uh, Krill said that just at the end of uh, his presentation. In Mexico, 43.1% uh, of Mexicans are classified as poor and 16.7 as extremely poor. And uh, where the top 10% of Mexican uh, households have 40% of the available income, the 10% of households at the bottom of this social pyramid receive less than 2%. So the disparity is really uh, striking. At the same time, uh, democracy has, uh, it has been impossible in democracy to modify the old tax system in order to make it possible some kind of income distribution or to allow the government to implement a set of social policies that can give a real chance uh, to those Mexicans that are now at the bottom of the social scale. No money and no agreement about how to get uh, uh, something um, for the government to work uh, in that direction. Tax reform has been one of the main uh, elements of uh, political discussion in Mexico, and uh, at, the, at the end, nobody has been able to produce something acceptable uh, to, to the majority of members in Congress. As, as Santiago Creed said, the problem of wor uh, working majority is really a, a, a problem in Mexico that is affecting the everyday life of Mexicans. Finally, there is no agreement about what should be the nature of the relationship with the United States. Now that the so-called revolutionary nationalism is history, past history, and the present North American Free Trade Agreement is not working as it was supposed to work. Former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jorge Castañeda, for example, wanted an open and active support for the US policies in regard to Cuba or to Iraq. He advocated, in fact, a policy not very different from the one followed uh, in Spain by uh, Jose Maria Aznar. More or less that kind of uh, um, policy was, from his point of view, the only policy that was uh, adequate to the NAFTA. If we are uh, really committed to a deep integration with the US in economic uh, sense, well, let's follow uh, uh, in, the, in the political field as well. But public opinion and Congress especially were again dead set uh, uh, against this uh, kind of, of policy. So as you can see, uh, masses, uh, according to opinion polls, surveys, are not really very committed to democracy. They accept it as, as, uh, as a good a, a political regime, but deep down are not yet uh, really uh, committed to this. And the elites, while they have an agreement, there is no alternative to democracy, they don't have uh, any kind of agreement about everything else. The, the, those things that are the, the material basis for democracy, in that aspect, the elites are totally divided. Last year's subsidies to political parties cost the Mexican taxpayer slightly more than $400 million. It was an electoral year, so uh, Mexico is an stagnated economy, but the parties are, uh, among other things, are good business. Uh, no, no doubt about it. 
At the same time, the image of corruption is there is a costly party apparatus, uh, but you have to put together the cost and the image of corruption and inefficiency. Probably is not fair to look at them as inefficient, but in the eyes of a Mexican public, they are doing nothing. They are being paid for doing nothing. It's unfair, probably, but that is uh, the perception. According to a last month public opinion poll conducted by Maria de las Heras, only 11% of the respondents had confidence in the leadership of the three main political parties. Only 11. They had more confidence, slightly more confidence in PAN and less confidence in PRI and even less in PRD. A, a survey sponsored by the Chamber of Representatives uh, very recently found that 87 of the respondents considered that Mexican representatives are not representing what they are supposed to represent, the voters. Uh, so the, the opinion, public opinion, uh, is very negative about uh, the role of Congress that is the core of the political uh, party system. Democratic disillusionment is a fact in Mexico. However, if we want to be relatively optimistic, we can go to the definition of democratic consolidation proposed by Juan Linz and Alfred Stepan. They consider that democracy is consolidated when it is, and I quote, the only game in town because there is no political party or significant political group that is supporting an alternative to democracy. In Mexico, as I said, the elites can be very critical of the quality of democracy, but no significant group seems to be actively looking for a different path of development. That is a positive side of the equation. But the fact that last year, 58 of the electorate, the voters, did not care to vote, and 3% destroy or nullify their ballots, that uh, makes 61%, uh, plus other indicators presented before are telling us about a mass of people that can be, and that's my fear, can be available. Is not, right now, this is not a fact, but it can be available for uh, non-democratic mobilization if the disillusionment continues to deepen. Let me close this brief presentation of the conditions of Mexican democracy, quoting the key conclusion of the United Nations Development Program on the status of democratic development in Latin America that fits the Mexican case quite well. I quote, in no other region of the world there is so much democracy, poverty, and inequality together as in Latin America. So uh, we can, end of the quote, we can say the same thing about Mexico with a twist. In no other time of our history, the traditional companions of Mexico's development, poverty, inequality, governmental incompetence, and corruption, have uh, been joined by the recently acquired political, uh, political democracy. Now democracy is joining the other uh, factors, but not displacing them. They are together but they cannot remain together for a long, since they are incompatible. In the long run, we cannot uh, see this uh, situation functioning. In the long run, democracy has to prevail over poverty, inequality, corruption, and governmental incompetence. I hope uh, that we will be able to do, to be up to the, to the task uh, in, in, in the near future. Otherwise, I will think that the consolidation of Mexican democracy can be a, a fact. I don't want it. I think that uh, very few want to have this uh, kind of development in Mexico, but if we don't do something serious in regard to these problems, well, that can be a possibility. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our final 
panelist is uh, Dr. Jorge Chabat, professor at the Centro de Investigación y Docencia Económica in Mexico City. These slides, I <laughs> not yet. Okay, much better. Well, I have prepared, a, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure for, for me to be here in, in Chicago. Thanks to the organizers. And well, I, I have prepared my presentation in English or in a language similar to English, so I hope you understand. <laughs> Uh, well, as you can, the, the title of the presentation is Security Reforms and Democratic Consolidation in Mexico. As you can see, there is a mistake. It's democratic. Uh, obviously, it's a mistake, but before this presentation, I was thinking, well, maybe I have invented a new term. Democratic could be the combination between democracy and hectic. No? So that's probably a new way to describe the transition to democracy in Mexico. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Good. Well, first of all, I, I, I will concentrate on the, the, as, the aspects of security and how the, the the reforms there, or the lack of reforms in that area, are affecting democracy in Mexico. Uh, brief background, well, takes me to the fact that national security in general, not only security, but national security in Mexico, has had a very confusing legal framework. Things are changing, and there are now some efforts to, to, to define that in, in, in the law. Uh, obviously, the judicial system has worked only for rich people, poor people in Mexico has no access to justice. Well, that's something that everybody knows. Uh, another platitude, police has been highly corrupt and inefficient. Uh, reforms did not have continuity, especially in the area of, of security. That's probably one of the main problems. Uh, one government starts one reform and the other government does not follow this, this reform. And also Mexican state, that's another platitude, has been unable to provide efficient security to the people, and that's one of the most important obstacles, not only to democracy, but for the consolidation of Mexican state during the recent year. Well, during the 1980s and 1990s, there, was, there were some efforts to make some reforms in that area. Uh, the creation of the CISEN, Center for Investigation and National, uh, National Security, is a product of the disappearance of the uh, federal security office uh, in the 1980s. Uh, also, there were some efforts in that direction related to human rights and obviously affecting security and, uh, and human security, like the creation of the National Commission on Human Rights in 1990. Uh, there were some efforts in the area of drugs, like the creation of the National Institute for the Combat of Drugs, but obviously the creation of that institute and the disappearance of the institute uh, some years ago shows how difficult it is to make reforms in that area. And Cedillo made uh, some important reforms in this regard. Uh, he g gave more autonomy to, to the courts. He created the national system of public security, which is probably the most ambition, ambitious effort in that, in that regard. And he's still working, or more or less working, that's part of the problem. Uh, also, uh, Cedillo created the preventive federal police, which is uh, first big attempt to, to have a unified police in Mexico, and uh, released the organized crime bill that is tr try to put more penalties to uh, what is or organized, organized crime in Mexico. Well, how is defined security, national security and national development plan? Well, there is a link in the Fox administration between democratic transition and a reform in the area of security. Uh, first of all, in that plan, the, the, the Fox government establishes that there was a collusion, a, a, pardon, a confusion between the national interests and group interests in the, in, the, in the past, and that real threats were in attendance, and there was an increase in crime, corruption, and environmental degradation because of that. I mean, this is the first public recognition that the security was used not for go governmental purposes, but for private purposes or regime purposes. Uh, the National Development Plan also establishes that national security should respond to new times and new threats. I mean, this discussion that there are traditional and non-traditional threats. Uh, that the national security should be an instrument for the preservation of the real national interest and democratic advance. There is a clear linkage in that sense. And also it establishes that it is necessary that the state, state possess sufficient timely and reliable information to guarantee national security and in that, in that way also human security and direct security of, the, of, of citizens. And the emphasis is put during the Fox administration on the area of information, intelligence, and information sharing. Well, 
the, the national security strategy in the Falcon administration, the, I'm gonna go to, to this very, very briefly. It established, well, a broad concept of security, as I have mentioned. Uh, mentioning situations uh, threatening peace, judicial order, welfare, and physical integrity of people that put, uh, put at risk institutions or territorial integrity. It uh, develops a doctrine for identification, evaluation of the factors that can put at risk national security and for the effective protection of Mexico's vital interests and the new law on national security goes in this direction. It will establish the need to elaborate a risk agenda to promote prevention uh, measures in government actions through a systematic analysis of the risk of national security. It also establishes the development of a judicial and institutional framework that respect constitutional guarantees of citizens and coordinates federal government offices at the, at the true levels of government. It also establishes that it is necessary to prevent in a timely and efficient way risk and threats to national security, democratic governance, and rule of law. I mean, this, this aspect is, is, is there, at least mentioned in the, in the, in the documents. Uh, through the operation of a system of investigation, information, and analysis that contributes to the preservation of integrity, stability, and permanence of the Mexican state. And finally, it established that it is necessary to promote a legal framework, and it has been one of the main challenges of this government, of this government that establishes what is the national security of the Mexican state and its elements, and the federal intelligence agencies should be ruled by the operational criteria of a democratic state and an institutional accountability system. Well, that's what the Fox administration has uh, put on in, in the documents in the National Development Plan. And be, well, before going to what is, going, is happening in, in, in Mexico in this area, what reforms are, are taking place, I should mention briefly what has been the impact on September 11 because it has had a, an impor important impact in terms of the concept of security in Mexico and the future of, of reforms in that area. First of all, there are U United States pressure to securitize, me securitize Mexican borders, which is not necessarily the best way to, to solve the problems of security because it can affect also uh, human rights and it has other uh, side consequences. Uh, the, uh, there has been the development of smart mechanisms in U.S.-Mexico border that also ha ha can have these risks, or the, the risk of attending uh, human, human rights abuses. And obviously these this risks are not only for Mexicans, but only for foreigners that are going to, into, into Mexico, especially I insist, after September 11 and this, the risk of, the, the, the look of, for terrorists and all these this kind of new threats. What have been the reforms during the Fox administration? Well, uh, Fox created the, the Secretary of Public Security with Mr. Gertz in, in charge. Uh, Fox also have restructured the office of the Attorney General, uh, basically creating the Federal Agency for Investigation, the AFI, which tries to be a kind of Mexican FBI. Uh, Fox also had uh, promoted the, the issue of uh, a national security law that has been approved that basically regulates intelligence activities. is not a very broad law, but, but I mean, at least it's, it's trying to, to put some clear limits so, to what the CISEN particularly can do and cannot do, establishing some requirements for intervening communication. I mean, I think it's an important step in, in the right direction, but uh, probably it's, 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 it's only limited to intelligence activities. And finally, well, there is a big, big reform, big, huge reform uh, that I'm not sure that is going to be approved, but uh, even discussed, you know, that is a, a reform on security and criminal justice. It implies basically the reorganization of police forces to create a one only federal police in a new minister of, or secretary of the interior that will replace the, the secretary of public security um, you know, putting together the judicial, the judicial federal police in the, from the PGR and the preventive police, put them all together in one, one police, which is obviously a major change in, in the history of Mexican police forces. Uh, it also try, tries to, trans, to transform the PGR, the Attorney General's office, into an independent investigative office with no police, only you know, kind of uh, investigative body uh, more in the, in, the American, in the American model, and also is trying to reform the criminal justice system, establishing public trials like in the United States, which I mean, 
in general terms, I, I think the idea is good, but I don't know how we can change the culture and the traditions and the practices of 400 or 500 years in, in, in a very short period of time. It takes me to the security, I mean, to the, to the challenges and dilemmas that the, the, the Fox administration is facing now in this, in this regard. First of all, this, there's a big dilemma that, I mean, is not only in security aspects, but in every aspect. Uh, what, is, what is necessary to do is, 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 is necessary to establish a legal reform and go to the Congress to that, or is, is, is probably better to, to look for a better performance, no? That's the, 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 the temptation of a radical, ambitious change is always there. Sometimes it's easy to send uh, a, a, a proposal of reform to the Congress and try to make the institution work. Well, maybe it's, it's not so difficult. I mean, it's, it's not so easy to make institutions work. But th there is always the temptation that, I mean, I want to pass to the history of the man who changes the, 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 the security system and the one man who made this big reform. No? Well, uh, this, this, this dilemma is, is in, in the, the area of security. I'm not sure that all the problems should be solved by legal changes. Maybe you should try also to, to make things work better, but this is a discussion that is, that is open. Uh, there is another, another point. Well, what is the appropriate sequence of, of reforms? What should be first? What do, should be second? I have the impression that uh, sometimes the government tries to, to change everything at the same time. In the case of the security and judicial reform, it's, it's very difficult to change everything at the same time because there are like three big reforms in that proposal. It's, in, from my point of view, it's very risky to establish public trials if you don't make ch changes before in the, in, the, uh, in the area of the, of the attorneys and, and all the, 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 the system in the PGR. I mean, I think there are too many changes in, in, one, in one package in, in, in a short period of time. Obviously, another point is, well, the lack of continuity in reforms. This has been a problem in many areas, but especially in the area of security. Reforms in the area of security take, take, take a lot of time. You cannot make changes in, in one or two, or two years. You cannot create new police efficient and honest in, in only one or two, three years. You, you cannot go to a shopping mall in San Antonio and, and buy 500 honest and efficient police. No, there is no such thing like that. You have to, to create a new police. It's, it's complicated. There are some vicious circles there. It takes time, it takes money, it takes political will. So you need a continuity of at least 15, 20 years to make a, a, a radical change in that area. And one very good example is the, is the national I mean, the national public security system, it has been established since the 1990s, and it's more or less working, but uh, there, I'm, I'm not sure there is a, a lot of continuity into that. The case of Morelos is very clear about it. I mean, the, the national uh, uh, public security system establishes that there, there should be a national data bank with the information of all policemen, and if you're gonna hire a, po a police chief, you should check that national data, data bank. Obviously, it didn't happen in the case of of Morelos for reasons that I, I don't know. No. Uh, well, obviously, the, the problem of, of a police, police reform requires to have honest and efficient police. Many people think that it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. Actually, if you have efficient police that is not honest, it's probably worse than to have an efficient police and not honest. No, it's, I don't know what, <laughs> is that the solution. You have to do both things at the same time. It's a different problem. You have to create institutions, accountability systems, not only better trained police. No? Uh, obviously, reforms in that area requires, require money, time, and political will. Uh, we don't have too much time. We don't have too much money. We could have political will, I don't know, but it's, it's complicated to do that. And finally, uh, reforms in security require that other reforms work. I mean, and that's complicated. So, I mean, I don't want to be very pe pessimistic, but uh, I think in changes in this area will take a lot of, of time if we are lucky. I mean, a lot of time, money, and, 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 and efforts. And I wouldn't be very optimistic, at, at least in, in this area. Well, finally, conclusions. Well, democracy requires that the state is able to provide security to citizens, to citizens and respect for human rights at the same time. That's a, a 
challenge for, for Mexico, doing this transformation without affecting human rights, especially in, in the times where U.S. pressure is, is big because of the fight to, to, against terrorism. Uh, securing Mexico has not been achieved in the past because of many reasons that are not easy to solve. Obviously, there was an undemocratic system, lack of continuity in reforms, there was corruption, and people was, uh, the same people is in the same places. Uh, Leo Trotsky said in 1932, I guess, uh, something about police. He said like, well, every policeman know, knows that uh, e even when governments may change, they stay, you know? I mean, police stay. They know that, and it's difficult to, to, to change, uh, to make changes because basically the human capital is, is more or less the same. Uh, what, are, what are the obstacles for imperial security? Well, I think you have a lot of, of, of obstacles. I, I insist that I want to be pessimistic, but pessimistic, but on the one hand, you have a domestic political environment right now that can contaminate uh, changes in security, even when you, we can say that probably in security there is there are less ideological difference, which I'm not totally sure, but well, in principle, you can say that everybody agrees that we have to have better security. Well, I, I'm not sure that we, we can get a, a consensus on that. And also, I insist the domestic political environment is so complicated, is, is, is so polarized that they, I'm not very optimistic, in, at least in the, the case of reforms in that area. There are United States pressures on Mexico in the war against terrorists. That doesn't help to create a security reform that is compatible with human rights. There are economic restraints, as, as everybody, everybody knows. Uh, change required, as I have said, long periods of time. Uh, there, are, there is a temptation of make a spectacular reforms. I mean, I insist that there is always there. It's easier to, 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 to send uh, changes that uh, will, will, that are radical and uh, that probably will uh, mean that uh, the, the pressing will pass to the history as the, as the guy who changed everything. You know? uh, I insist, well, I have mentioned police forces are the same, they stay there, so it's, it's complicated to, to make the changes without breaking the, I mean, you have to break vicious circles. And finally, well, security involves also many levels of government, not, not only federal, local, state, federal, and that also is, is very complicated because you can make reforms at the federal level, probably that, that sounds easy, it's not easy, but that sounds easy, but then you have to move to other, to other reforms, the local police that is, has been there for, for years, or obviously the situation changed from one state to another state, so in conclusion, the transition in this area is quite complicated, and it will take a lot of years if, 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 it's, if, if we can achieve that. But well, I'm going to stop here. Uh, you know, thanks for your, your attention. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, could we get someone to turn this off? And uh, I think now we have uh, some time for questions, and uh, you can direct your questions uh, either to a specific panelist or to all of them, and I uh, would also remind you that to give everybody an opportunity to ask questions, uh, please keep them uh, brief. Uh, so let's see if we can get the, the microphone up here in the front uh, and then get the questions started. Buenas tardes. Um, Para darle un, un poco de background de, de, este, de dónde vengo con mi idea, eh, soy terapeuta familiar y voy a empezar un doctorado aquí en la Universidad de Chicago en uh, la Escuela de Servicios Sociales, Administración de Servicios Sociales. Um, la presentación es, parece ser que se han concentrado en la necesidad de reformas. Um, ha habido muy gra grandes ideas, um, grandes estudiosos en el caso que vienen con unas grandes postulaciones hasta que lo que se puede hacer. Pero se ve que grandes reformas y grandes ideas han estado desarrollándose por muchos años y parece ser que estas reformas no están sirviendo. 
tenemos grandes políticos que, para mi saber, se han tenido una educación grandiosa en las grandes, grandes instituciones del mundo. Entonces, no dudo de su um, capacidad intelectual. Pero parece ser que el, lo que um, Hernando de Soto, por ejemplo, uh, cuenta como el contrato social, en realidad entender lo que las masas uh, quieren, en realidad desarrollar sistemas de entendimiento hacia lo que las masas que, son, que no son servidas, the underserved, masas todavía no se ha logrado y parte de este resultado puede ser porque estas reformas no han funcionado. Cosas como sistemas simplemente de, account, de, de responsabilidad, como puede ser el sistema legal. Los policías en la Ciudad de México ya instalaron cámaras para poder detectar la corrupción, pero si la necesidad de los policías de vía pública es de otorgar dinero a los sistemas uh, de arriba, entonces van a buscar otras maneras para poder continuar con, uh, um, con esa necesidad de traer uh, flujo de dinero para continuar el sistema. Entonces, mi, mi pregunta sería, ¿qué cuestiones pueden ser en lo micro? ¿Qué cuestiones ustedes pueden pensar que pueden ser los desarrollos de sistemas para entender las masas y después para, uh, para poder desarrollarlos uh, y que los políticos puedan representar estas necesidades y yo creo que por lo consiguiente puedan uh, funcionar. They would prefer if we took uh, three or four questions, and then there may be some overlaps in that way. So let's have let's have three or four questions in a row. Please keep your questions short, so that then we have another round of it, if possible, and then they'll take the questions together. Quizá para la doctora Pechard, mi nombre es María Noávila, del profesor de teología en el Seminario Calvino. Doctora Pechard, la reciente elección de un nuevo consejo electoral en el IFE, eh, parece que por el tipo de personas que se eligió y la forma que se hizo la elección, parece todo un punto de regreso a lo que había sido el, el IFE durante el tiempo que usted estuvo ahí. Quisiera oír su, su opinión, si realmente es un retraso a la democracia o realmente podemos tener esperanzas en un consejo como este. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es José Medina Arreguín, miembro del Consejo Estatal del PRD y asesor de la Federación de la, Fede, de la FEDECMET en California. Miren, este, yo me permito, quiero destacar muy atentamente que este, esto de la reformulación de las instituciones democráticas este, está contrariando la participación ciudadana, por la sencilla razón de que la clase política está preocupada por fortalecer las organizaciones ¿eh? sin formular proyectos mayoritarios. Se quejaba aquí el secretario de Gobernación eh, de, de, los, de los dilemas que, que le crea no poder fabricar mayorías pero realmente ellos no tienen ningún proyecto mayoritario. Pongámoslo, por ejemplo, en el caso de los derechos políticos, el único proyecto mayoritario que hay en México, con el cual debió de haber empezado el presidente Vicente Fox. Lo mencionaba muy bien el, el exponente Lorenzo Meyer, en el caso de Sudáfrica, donde la competencia fue encarnizada. ¿verdad? africanos contra boers y sus secuelas. Entonces, este, eh, pero ahí vimos que antes de entrar en la confrontación y antes de Mandela hubo muchos líderes, eso sí, líderes, no dirigentes. Aquí hay que contraponer definitivamente, como lo mencionaba algunos de que me antecedieron en la palabra, eh, 
tienen mucha, los políticos mexicanos, eh, principalmente los enquistados en, en las esferas de, de gobierno, eh, tienen, tienen mucha preparación, pero, pero no están listos. Tienen mucha preparación, yo no dudo de su capacidad intelectual, estoy dudando de su honestidad. ¿Le pido que haga su pregunta? Sí, favor. señor, sí. sí. Gracias. Claro que la voy a hacer. Sí. Entonces, este, ahí es donde yo quisiera ver efectivamente una respuesta y a ver si pudieran llevarse en algo. Este, quiero recalcar que soy eh, compilador de un proyecto de declaración de los derechos políticos de los mexicanos. Esto es, yo manifiesto aquí mi postura eh, de que la ausencia de derechos políticos plenos no solamente lesiona a los migrantes, lesiona a todos los mexicanos. Entonces, este, no hay por qué estar pidiendo tratamientos especiales. Este es otro vicio de, de los mexicanos. No tengo yo ninguna pregunta, que les quede bien claro que la solución en México no va a venir de la clase política, sino del pueblo que es de donde reside su soberanía. Gracias. Another question, please. Yes. Uh, my question is for Dr. Meyer. Um, there was an eminent economist here from the University of Chicago who once said, uh, in the long run, we are all dead. Uh, so my question is, is how long does Mexico have to progress sufficiently? Or is there a problem with uh, potentially in the next election, if it doesn't happen in a smooth way, or if there is an economic or monetary crisis, that your um, worst case scenario may May, uh, may be the, the result. One more question. Una consideración eh, particularmente para la doctora Pechard. Eh, durante la investigación de amigos de Fox, se detectó que 11 mil dólares habían llegado del extranjero a las eh, arcas de la campaña. Eh, mi impresión personal es que nunca hubo una multa siquiera por esta contribución. Esa es mi impresión. Eh, de alguna manera se avaló que se recibiera dinero del extranjero prácticamente, porque las multas se impusieron por otros, eh, otros problemas. Es, es mi impresión. Eh, durante esa investigación, el IFE prácticamente se negó a cruzar las fronteras mexicanas. Eso nosotros lo percibimos como un problema, es decir, el IFE, por ejemplo, se dijo, hay gente en California que puede probar y demostrar que hubo mucho más dinero entregado eh, a la campaña en el extranjero, pero el IFE no quiso ir a California a, eh, a ver esta situación y la gente que tenía esas pruebas no podía regresar a México porque ya no podría regresar a Estados Unidos otra vez. Eh, todo esto tiene que ver con el problema de la aplicación extraterritorial de las leyes. Se está hablando, por ejemplo, de la credencialización de los mexicanos en el exterior, y si eso sería un problema de aplicación extraterritorial de leyes. Eh, se está hablando de que en este acuerdo que mencionaba Krill, de que no podría haber campañas en el extranjero porque estarían más allá de la fiscalización eh, del IFE. Nosotros decimos que lo mismo que se está planteando en México, de que el IFE contrate los espacios en los medios de comunicación, se puede hacer aquí, que los contrate directamente el IFE y que no haya dinero ni, ni posibilidad de los partidos de de contratar acá sus propios medios, sino que vengan directamente contratados por el IFE. Pero a lo que quiero llegar entonces en todo esto es a ese ejemplo de Tabasco que usted mencionó. Si no participan los migrantes mexicanos plenamente en los procesos electorales de México, ¿serían legales las elecciones o podríamos de plano promover ante el trife que si no participamos nosotros, no votamos y no somos votados con plena capacidad, credencializados, etcétera, entonces la elección de, del 2006, pues simplemente sería ilegal. We, we'll take one last question, then we'll give the panelists a chance uh, to reply to all of them. Um, I'm glad to be here. It is an honor. My question relates to accountability. Essentially, we've spoken much for the need for solutions and the analysis of what the problems are, but what models, if any, 
are you seeking to follow for accountability? And as there are very few in the world, how do you um, seek to create this? Because although America is a democracy and people are very similar across the world, in many ways they are different and you must reforge a sense of democracy and you cannot create the same thing in America that's created in Mexico because our peoples still have different values and I was wondering how you seek to create accountability and then also incorporate those values in your constitution and in your structure because it cannot be the same. Thank you. So we'll just uh, give the panelists now uh, the chance to answer uh, these questions as they see fit. So just give it up. Okay, uh, let's uh, start with this side of the, the table. Uh, I think that in some of the questions have to do with the representation. How uh, make it possible for an um, average Mexican to be represented at the different levels of government? I, I agree that is one of the big uh, questions. We have a crisis of representation. I think that the political parties right now, there are only three, uh, because the others are uh, really almost irrelevant. These three parties are concentrated in themselves. They are looking at, at their interior. They are fighting among themselves in a very ferocious way. Uh, and the, the majority of Mexicans don't feel represented by the parties. Probably that is also true by the, in the United States that uh, the majority feel uh, outside the Republican and the Democratic Party. But the difference is that this is a consolidated democracy. And ours is a democracy in the process of consolidation. So the sense of not being represented is, uh, repre uh, puts us in a, in a different uh, situation. The problem is real. I think that the parties are not making an effort to go down to the social ladder and really be able to capture the essence of what Mexicans are uh, wanting. One solution, partial solution, is re-election. That has been uh, posed as, as a partial but interesting solution. Let us make the uh, average representative or senator responsible to the people that elected him, because right now, once he's elected, he's responsible to the leadership, to the small oligarchic system that controls each party. The political career of each uh, one of them is not tied to re-election, because there is no re-election. It's to the goodwill of the leadership. All depends on what the leadership will do or do not in regard to his own personal career. So they are very responsible but not to the, to the Mexican voter. They are responsible to the leadership. Let us change the, uh, this situation, put it upside down. Uh, one of the uh, answers, as I said, partial answer, is re-election. But it's only, uh, uh, is, is, is not the, 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 the whole answer. The other problem is civil society. Uh, Mexican civil society is still in its infancy. Uh, in, um, in the past, the, the traditional uh, way of controlling Mexico was through corporate uh, structures. In the colonial period, there was no uh, sense in, in being individualistic. The individual didn't exist. It was uh, the organization of miners, uh, traders, the uh, pueblos de indios, the uh, Indian towns, everything was organized around corporations. Well, uh, now democracy is uh, rejecting the traditional corporative structure of the PRI, but is not substituting it with a, a vibrant uh, civil society organized in an independent way that can uh, present challenges, demands, and punish the political uh, uh, elite if they fail to comply. It's only, right now, it's beginning to emerge, but it takes time. It takes time. And uh, one of the, uh, the questions is uh, about time. For how long the Mexican uh, 
society can remain uh, in peace and willing to accept this uh, kind of low quality democracy. The, the question is, is important, relevant, but I really don't know the answer because the, the, the moment in which society, Mexican society has said, I'm fed up with the, with the system and somebody decides to do, uh, uh, to go in a different way, generally a violent way, it has been unpredictable. Uh, the 1910 revolution, nobody thought about the, the revolution, not even Madero. He thought that he was doing something, uh, but not a revolution. So uh, the, the revolution came uh, out of the blue, really, when distortions and, and malfunctioning at the, at the elite level provide the opportunity, if it's an opportunity, uh, to start a, um, a revolution. So I think that is at the level of the elite uh, that the, the problem is uh, right now can be solved and it's important. The elite is not functioning, it's always fighting. And I think that there is a kind of suicidal tendency in the political class uh, in Mexico because they are losing uh, status, all of them, PRI, PAM, PRD, the presidency, uh, representatives, senators, everybody. And they continue along the same path. The main bulk of their energies is devoted to fight among themselves. Uh, well, uh, I cannot answer the, the question about how, for how long Mexico can go with this low quality democracy without uh, um, uh, having a, 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 a negative uh, and decisive impact in Mexican uh, political development. But I think uh, that right now, the leadership is beginning to have a sense of urgency. I hope, I hope uh, that the elections of the uh, year 2006 will be a catalyst uh, to introduce this sense of urgency among Mexican leadership. But uh, really, I don't have an answer. Okay, I will we'll deal with three questions. One that has to do with the big reforms that have not been useful. It is true that we have been spoken about uh, the necessary reforms in Mexico on different uh, areas. However, I would say that in the case of electoral reforms, electoral reforms have been very effective. That is, uh, the relation between uh, the rule of law and the effective practice in electoral matters have been very strict. I mean, the, the relation is uh, very direct. So I would say that uh, there is an example here in the electoral field that uh, shows how uh, the application of law can be followed strictly. Regarding the election of the electoral councillors, the election last October, I, I would say that uh, I cannot call it a, re a regression. The, the process, the appointment process of the electoral councillors uh, stick to the rule and follow uh, what the law says, that is, that it has to be um, appointed. They have to be appointed by a majority, a two-third majority in the Chamber of Deputies, and it was done that way. So I would say that there's no regression. However, I would say that it was not politically convenient because um, electoral councillors, that is my experience, was that it was very important for the electoral authority to count on the support of the different political parties. And in this case, electoral councillors will have to deal with the fact that there is at least one of the three main parties that did not support this appointment process. So uh, that is a sort of obstacle that electoral councillors, electoral authority, will have to face, particularly in the 2006 election. And uh, regarding Amigos of Fox investigation, um, yes, actually we, um, we could uh, determine that there were $11,000 uh, that uh, reached the, the Fox uh, campaign and it was uh, fined. Actually, it was one of the, 
of the irregularities that was uh, most severely fined because we, we thought that receiving money, that is that a campaign receiving money from abroad was uh, really something that we should not accept because it's clearly stated in the electoral code. Now, during the investigation, it is true that uh, IFE did not send delegates to the United States to, um, to keep track of the people that uh, might have had any relations with Amigos of Fox uh, campaign. But what we did uh, was asking uh, IFE's delegates, you know IFE has delegates all around the country, so we asked our frontier uh, delegates to find out if they could uh, enter in contact with uh, the other borderline um, officers in the Mexican uh, consulates so as to see if we could get to the people. So uh, the investigation was done even if we, I mean, if his officers did not cross physically the, the American border. Now regarding uh, what might happen if, uh, for example, the electoral tribunal might uh, think that if uh, not all the Mexican uh, citizens had uh, effectively the right to vote in 2006, I mean regarding uh, Mexicans living abroad, I would say that uh, we cannot think of that possibility because it's true that Mexicans abroad have the right to vote, but if this right is not uh, positively regulated, then obviously uh, the electoral court cannot take this as, a, uh, as one of the reasons why an election might be annulled. Okay, well, very briefly, uh, there were two questions related to the problem of accountability, and I agree that this is one of the most important points in any democratic transition consolidation or whatever. Um, and well, the bad news is that we don't have magic uh, solutions that we cannot say, well, if we create this law tomorrow, we will have accountability and corruption is gone. No, that, that won't work that way. Uh, probably what we have to do is to, to do small changes, concentrate energies in one institution and then in another, into another institution. It's not possible to make the complete reforms uh, involving justice and police and everything in just one night. Uh, one example that probably can show us how things can be done, even accepting that there are still some problems there, is the Federal Preventive Police, which from my point of view, despite all the problems that it, it can have, is, is one of the most successful examples of reforming institution. It works more or less well. and. Uh, it takes time to do that, and obviously you, need, you require a stick and carrot. I mean, you, 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 need, you have to, to, to have a, a stronger surveillance mechanisms. At, at the same time, you have to, to have positive incentives. If you maintain the salaries you, have, you, you pay to the police now, nowadays, well, it's difficult to make any decent reform. You have to pay them better, and you have to, to have better surveillance mechanisms. But I'm convinced that we can have good police in Mexico. I mean, I don't see how or why we are condemning forever to have corrupt police. That I don't, I don't think we have that in, in the genes of the Mexicans. And I mean, other countries have, uh, have made successful uh, uh, transformations and reforms in this area. But the bad news is that I think it's gonna take a lot of time. I mean, and probably one day we will open the eyes, oh, we have a decent police. When, that, when did it happen? Well, who knows? It happened in the last 30 years, well, okay. So, but yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the point is that there are many vicious circles, and vicious circles are very difficult, very difficult to, to break. Uh, but I think it's possible. We, we were able to have free elections in Mexico, what, what I thought was going to be impossible during my lifetime. So I think we can make change, but we'll take time and, and patience. And well, that's probably something we don't have too much in, in, in Mexico. Thanks. Uh, so now please join me in thanking the panelists for a very stimulating presentation.